As we start chapter three on infinity, we hit section 3.1, Beyond Numbers, and the subtitle, What Does Infinity Mean? We throw the word infinity around like, like it actually means something, right? And you, you kind of understand that infinity is really big. Uh, infinity is beyond all number. But what does it mean? Like literally, the title of the section here, what does it mean to be beyond number? Uh, we can use a, a number. I don't even know how to call how many millions of billions of trillions of whatever. Just reading that out loud, right? As it says here, that, that'd be rough. Can you imagine trying to factor that? Who knows? But when it comes to infinity, this, that's like a drop in the bucket. That's nothing. Um, back in the 19, uh, 2000s, maybe, uh, Michael Jordan uh, got a lot of bad press because he was blowing hundreds of dollars and thousands of dollars on rounds of golf, right? $100 a hole, $1,000. Um, and that's no big deal for him. That's 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 huge for us, or for me at least. Um, but infinity is is even beyond all the money that every professional athlete has ever actually made in their life, right? Or ever will. So, in order to understand what infinity means, what do our numbers themselves mean? All right, it all has to start somewhere. We're all familiar with two, um, and let's let's kind of use that to go from here. If we have two apples and two hands, we could put one apple in each hand, and no hand would be unappled or any apple unhanded. Two to two, right? And we talked about these one-to-one uh, -one correspondences in chapter two. And as long as we have one car to match up with one soccer ball, and each car has each soccer ball, right? We could keep doing this forever. It's the one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, when when two collections have a one-to-one -one correspondence, we say they're equally numerous, equally numerous. Mm. They, they have the same number of objects. Uh, for example, uh, when before number even existed, the shepherds still had to make sure they came back with everything. So they might pick up a pebble for every sheep that left the, the home pasture. When they get to the grazing fields, right? As long as they can match up a rock for every uh, sh sheep, mm. English hard, um, uh, language, the, yeah, um, grammar, that's what it is, grammar's hard, um, you know, as long as the pebbles and the sheep's matched up at the graving, at the grazing, excuse me, and back home at the home uh, fields, everything was good. If you had more rocks, you know, you, you lost some sheep. If you have more sheep than rocks, you gain somebody else's and you probably branded those pretty quickly. So the exercises I would like for you to look at today, um, we're going to start with number four. You walk into class late and notice a bunch of backpacks lying against one wall. How would you check to see if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between backpacks and the students in the room? Is there a way to pair up each backpack with a student? Well, come on now. You are college students, and you are capable of being accepted into a major university. Don't overthink this, all right? Just let it be. Yeah, have each person grab their backpack. That's it. Don't overthink it. Keep it simple. Uh, number eight. The following are two collections of the symbols, the at symbol and the copyright symbol. Are there more ats than copyrights? And I would say no. Uh, describe how you could quickly answer the question without counting. Now, when I did that, I didn't count, right? I can see that there's one over top of each. So if the length of them are the same, they must have the same number of elements, right? That's the idea of a one-to-one -one correspondence. We could draw a line for each of these, all right? But we don't have to because we can see that that is the matchup. And we could go to the end and know, since we don't have to know how many there are, we only need to know that there's the same number. Number 14, testing one, two, three. A professor wishes to distribute one examination to each student in the class. What is the most efficient way for her to determine whether she has more students than exams? Pass out the exams or count. Uh, most efficient, pass out the exams. Absolutely one-to-one -one correspondence. If, if you pass them all out and you still have exams, 
uh, somebody's absent. If you pass them all out and somebody doesn't get an exam, you have too many students and um, somebody probably needs help with their schedule. All right, but to count, there's so many errors in counting. Uh, papers get stuck together. Students might be, I don't know, bending down to their backpack and didn't notice. You never know what's going to happen. So pass out the exams and use a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, laundry day, number 15. Suppose you're given a bag of quarters. The laundry machine, uh, laundry machine requires a dollar seventy-five. One way to count how many washes you could do is take out one quarter and say 25, then take out another 50, right? 75, a dollar, a dollar and a quarter, a dollar fifty, a dollar seventy-five. In practice, however, you might well use a different method that uses the notion of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Explain such a method. Now, what would you do? For me, I would say four quarters is a dollar and three quarters is 75 cents. So seven quarters is going to give me my dollar 75. So rather than counting what it consists of, right, 25, how much the, the value is, I might just count how many quarters do I have. There's a stack of seven and then I might just put stacks next to it and go from there. Right, just all possibilities that you could have on number 15. Number 16, um, I, I spoke of this on, on Discord uh, in the fall of 22. I guess if I use this in future classes, maybe I didn't. Um, it's, it's an interesting one here. Do there exist two non-bald people on Earth such that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the collection of hairs on one's person, one person's body and the collection of hairs on the other person's body. Feel free to use facts from previous chapter, chapters, but explain how they provide an answer to the one-to-one -one correspondence question. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. So, probably not a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Now that I'm actually looking at this question, what I answered on Discord was wrong. Uh, okay, so the collection of hairs on one person's body and the collection of hairs on the other person's body. Yes. Oh, so this is this is actually saying, can two non-bald, my goodness, that confused me. Can two non-bald people have an equal number of hairs. Uh, body hairs. All right, so that's what it's actually asking. So let's separate that there. <sighs> okay, so here's what we know from chapter two. From chapter two, we know that there are uh, probably less than five million hairs, right, on the human body. Uh, we found a number from there. Check this. Make sure that's what you got. Make sure I'm remembering correctly. I didn't go back and look. About 5 million hairs on the, uh, at most on any human body. We also know there are 8 billion humans. I guess I called them people up here. I should call them people again, but it's billion humans. So suppose only 4 billion humans are non-bald, right? Suppose half of them are babies and people that no longer have hair, um, adults that no longer have hair. Um, well, if, if the max that any person could have is 5 million hairs, but there are more than 5 million people that are not bald, then there must be two of them that correspond in some way, right? You, sh you, you have the exact same number. Of My dogs. You have the exact, you have the exact same number of body hairs as another human on this earth. Creepy. At least one, maybe more. All right, that's it for section 3.1. Thanks for listening.